church, clap your hands. We're walking by faith this morning. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying against. I'm all work bound. Oh Lord, I plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay. Where doubts arise and fear dismay, though someday it dwells where those who found I'll my head is higher ground. Lord,
thankful that God has given us a purpose and he's called us by name. Each and every one of us, we have a hope and a future through him. I love to think about the moment as Hebrews 1 tells us that Jesus, when he completed his work, ascended to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And what the celebration must have been like in heaven to see the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, in his rightful place, above all. This morning we have an opportunity to respond to that, knowing that Jesus, our hope and our salvation, completed the work, paid the penalty of sin and death. And now we get to lift his praises together this morning to declare him King of Kings, Lord of Lords, all glory, all honor, all praise is his, and his faithful love will endure forever. So let's sing. Old oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall and bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. He chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and you 
are, Lord. And all your promises are yes and amen. And I'm thankful for that, yes. That all your promises are yes and amen. Yes, our Father's promises are not just a baby. It's a yes. He never runs out of love. His supplies are never ending. Father, thank you for your goodness as we continue to sing this morning. now more than ever before we'll find you here and I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises my confidence is Lord is your faithfulness now i will rest in your promises in my talk about when your whole life as a pilot is preparation for that moment of crisis because we don't get any warnings that crises are coming in life and I feel sure that's probably the same as a pilot I mean you you don't always get a lot of warning when something is going to happen I mean obviously you have warning notifications and so on and so forth but I'm talking about that that one crisis of a lifetime as a pilot, how important is your whole career and your whole experience as a pilot for that moment, uh, that, that, that moment of your worst crisis? Yeah, that, that brings up a very important part of aviation. There, there are two words, You've, you may have heard these, but there's currency, which is really a legal definition, and it's a minimal preparation. Okay, then there's proficiency, which means your skills are sharp and they're not 
waning from lack of use. So the most perishable thing I know, see if you agree, is instrument flying. If you don't fly in actual weather, on instruments, routinely, your skill set falls off very, very fast. When it comes time to execute, when you're faced with that moment that you never thought was going to happen to you, no one knows how you're going to react. But I will tell you this, odds are you're going to fall back on what your training is. You're going you're gonna to go back to those places where you've been. You're going to go back to what you know. And it's just human nature. Everyone's, everyone does that, myself included. So when you have that repetition, when you have that pattern, when you have that, um, that execution every day, when the bad day comes, it's second nature. You just go through the process and it results in good results. By the way, do you appreciate Joe and Stacy's contribution to this series? I'll start the message in just a moment. Let me talk about the series that begins next weekend at New Spring, Desperado 2, When Someone You Count On Won't Come to Their Senses. This is a huge series. It will be led by Pastor Jonathan Hoover, who's not only our senior associate pastor, he's also a psychologist. And I gotta tell you what, there's going to be enormous practical help in this series, because all of us love someone, count on someone who, have, who is having a hard time coming to their senses. So you're going to get enormous help in this series. I can't wait to hear it myself. It is great to have a son who's a psychologist because I get a lot of free help and I need it. So uh, it's going to be great. It starts next weekend. Well, a few weeks ago, we did a video in where you got introduced to the set shop team, uh, captained by Dale Poor, along with Michelle and Pat and Daryl, and you saw how the plane was built. I want you to meet another team because I'm blessed to be surrounded by great young leaders. And so when God gives me the idea for one of these series, it's very quick that I start calling in members of this team uh, to talk with them about how we're going to be able to present this series. And so uh, I want you to meet that team today. I want you to kind of see some of the backstory. Let me just tell you, first of all, I do think the Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. And definitely these, these young men and women deserve honor because what they care about more than anything is not the cool factor. They care about getting the word of God into people's lives and seeing life change. But there's another reason why I want to do this because I know we have a lot of young people at New Spring. We have a lot of preteens, teens, and kids. I want them to know that you can use your gift, no matter what your gift is, to give the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't necessarily have to do what I do, but... There are all kinds of gifts. I mean, you're going you're gonna to meet our animator. You're, you're, you're going to meet our graphic arts genius. Um, and what they're doing, they're using their gifts, their Holy Spirit-given gifts, to present the message. So would you just take a look for the next minute or so at this team? Our teams have been preparing for the message series Flying by Instruments since last fall. As our set team began their build of the 60% scale King Air for the auditorium, our art director TJ started exploring different looks and designed the series graphic. Next, our film director Justin storyboarded shots for the Flying By Instruments promotional video, then took a special local flight in a King Air to capture the footage. For the shots in the video that couldn't be captured practically, featuring the exterior of the plane, our animator DJ customized a 3D digital model of a King Air, complete with the New Spring logo, and composited the model into footage of the sky. The finished video was played during our Christmas Eve services to invite people to come back at the beginning of the year for this January series. The construction of the plane for the stage took the set team a little over three months to complete, and during the first week of January, we began the process of hanging it in South Auditorium, this happened in partnership with our AVL manager, Daniel, and the production team, who built the superstructure to support the plane. After it was attached and elevated, the team adjusted the height of the plane to ensure the best visibility from various points in the room. 
Then our assistant production manager, Brandon, programmed the lights the set shop had included to make the plane look as authentic as possible and lit the exterior to make sure each detail was featured. We do all this because we want to create irresistible environments that set the stage for life change. Everything we do at New Spring, down to each creative detail, is designed to help people connect with Jesus Christ. Wow. I wanted you to see these presentations because I get an enormous amount of comments about how wonderful the series was and how much they appreciate me. I always want you to know I'm not preaching by myself. I have a whole team of people who are helping me get the word of God out here at New Spring Church. And I want you to know them and I want you to be able to say hello to them when you see them. I guess it's the most famous aviation story in the last 50 years in America, probably the most famous aviation story of all time. On January 15, 2009, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 took off from LaGuardia in New York City. At the controls was a veteran pilot with nearly 30 years of flying experience for the airline. The first officer, Jeff Skiles, was another experienced pilot. And with that level of expertise in the cockpit, there was no reason for the passengers to expect anything but a normal routine flight from New York to Charlotte. But shortly after takeoff, nothing was routine. The plane ran into, and we can understand that here in Wichita, the plane ran into a flock of Canadian snow geese, and the bird strike incapacitated both engines. Passengers would later describe the horror they felt. They said it was like a plane hit a brick wall. People on the left side of the cabin started screaming because the left engine was on fire. But up in the cockpit, the captain and the first officer knew that things were a lot worse than even people understood because both engines were dead. The pilot, Chesley Sullenberger, quickly realized that he wasn't going to be able to return to LaGuardia or he couldn't make nearby Teterboro. So he made the amazing decision, and I still can't wrap my mind around this as many times as I've seen the movie and the rescue. I, I cannot wrap my mind around the fact how that this experienced pilot determined to set the plane down, this airliner, on the Hudson River. I mean, it still, like I said, it blows my mind. An Airbus A320 with no power. The idea of landing it on a river is beyond my wildest comprehension. But Sullenberger worked it out in his mind with only seconds to do it. Many of us have seen the movie. I watched it the other day. It's one of my favorite movies. I like biographical movies if the story's true. And I love the movie, Sully. Well, after he set the plane down on the Hudson, rescue boats came and took the passengers off the wings and here's the most amazing thing. All 155 people on the plane survived with minimal, minimal, minimal injuries. It was that day that Chesley Sullenberger became the stuff of what real life legends are made of. In this age of sappy social media influencers and saccharine reality TV stars, we're kind of short on real heroes in America. Not that we don't have them, it's just we don't talk about the real heroes very much. And we could look at Sullenberg and we could say, no, there's a real hero. Mayor Bloomberg called him Captain Cool. What a name. I like that. <laughs> now, you know what? I wouldn't deny any of that. It's one of my favorite stories in American history. And like I say, I think it's probably the most famous aviation story, at least in the last 50 years. But I do need to challenge something. I want to challenge something that Americans tend to gravitate toward, a particular kind of understanding. In case anybody has the idea that Sullenberger just happened on the solution as a lucky response, I want you to hear his words. And I also want to, by letting you hear his words, I want to introduce you to the last talk of our series, Flying by Instruments. Sullenberger said, as he guided the plane down to the Hudson, it was, and I quote, the worst sickening pit of your stomach falling through the floor feeling that he'd ever had. But it's what he went on to say after that that really gets my attention. And like I say, it really does set us up for this last message. He, he said, and I want us to just slow down, and, and I think this will be on the screens where you can read it. He said, one way of looking at this might be that for 42 years, I've been making small, regular deposits in this bank of experience, education, and training. And on January 15th, the balance was sufficient so that I could make a very large withdrawal. This is the last message of our series, Flying by Instruments. And I don't need to go over what the series is about, probably because most of you have heard me do it for the last four weeks. 
But one more time, just to go over it in case somebody might be here for the very first time. Eight years ago, I did another series where I kind of used an aviation theme, and we had a 737 over my head at that point. But I had reached out to Joe. You met Dr. Joe Beck on the videos. I reached out to Joe. We sat at a Starbucks one day, and I said, Joe, give me some flying language, because I've never flown anywhere except in the back of the plane. I said, give me some flying language so I won't sound as dumb as I am. And so he started off really basic with me, and he said, Pastor, there are two kinds of pilots. There are VFR pilots. He said, that's where we all start. He said, VFR pilots means visual flight rules. You're dependent on what you see out your windshield. But he said in time that you can become certified as IFR. He said, you get so well trained that even if what you see out your windshield is nothing but clouds or darkness or bad weather. And he said, obviously, you can't trust your feelings because of the vestibular system can kind of screw things up. But he said, these pilots are so well trained that they read their instruments and they can keep flying on days when VFR pilots can't fly. And I thought to myself, I've just heard the greatest definition of the quality that the Bible says is most important, faith. Faith is how you get saved. Faith is how you please God. Faith is how you live the Christian life. And as I've said to you so many times, I know you're so, you could say it to me because I've said it so much to you. It, it could be that some people have the idea that faith is wanting to believe something is true. I, I even see signs on walls and stuff where you can kind of tell that's the definition of faith. Faith is believing what you want to believe. That's not faith. That's fantasy. See, faith is not wanting to believe something and just saying, I believe, I believe, I believe. No, 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 no. That's hope. Hope hope is expectation that's based on dependence on God. We can have faith in, in, for instance, if, if I got a scenario in my life that I'm really needing God to do something that he hasn't promised to do, I can put faith in his character. I can put faith in his power. I can put faith in his love for me. But I can't claim by faith that God is going to do something that he hasn't promised to do. This is the reason why a lot of people lose their faith. What's happened is they've misdefined faith. And because they've not gotten what they believe God was going to do, then they begin to question faith. Well, the whole problem with that is there's a misdefinition of faith. Faith is having superior information. It is taking the promises of God and putting such confidence in those promises that we can keep flying on days when other people can't fly. Well, I think there's a misunderstanding, another misunderstanding of faith, and it goes back to Sullenberger's comment. And, and please know, this is not the fault of people. This is the fault of preachers, people like me. And the idea goes something like this. And the idea is that faith is like something that you keep on a shelf, kind of like medicine in a medicine cabinet. And it's not something that you have to have all the time. In other words, you, you get a crisis, and then you just pull faith off the shelf. I mean, too much information, but I deal with migraines. Thankfully, I don't have them very often. I only have one probably two or three times a year. Yesterday, I had one coming on. I know the signs. I, I, I went to my to my cabinet and rummaged through the medicine, and there it was. There, there was my... And my migraine information, my migraine medicine. I took it. A few minutes later, I was fine. But I don't carry that around with me. I don't have it in my hand all the time because it's just something I go to when I get into a difficult situation. And I think a lot of pastors have communicated that that's what faith is like. It's not something you carry around with you. It's just something that you keep up on the shelf. And whenever you get into a crisis, you take faith out and you use it. And I've been guilty of this as I thought back on the 47 years I've been preaching. Well, actually, 47 years I've been pastoring. I was preaching before that. I've been guilty of doing this inadvertently. And and I think this is how it happens. I would tell a story about a Christian who was having a crisis. And then I'd talk about how they use faith. And I think that misunderstanding has gotten into the groundwater of the church. See, it's not God's idea that faith or flying by instruments is something that we keep on a shelf until we get into trouble. I want you to look at these words from the Bible, and I realize I'm about to give you four verses that all sound the same, but I just want you to see that God repeats something over and over. Well, actually, I think five. Let's go to the first one, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, which is the series verse. We live by faith and not by sight. Now, think about that. We don't get it off the shelf. We live by faith. Habakkuk 2 verse 4, the righteous will live by his faith. Galatians 3 11, the righteous will live by faith. Hebrews 10 38, my righteous ones will live by faith. This is just God saying to us over and over and over, this is to be a daily thing. This is to be a flying by instruments thing. It's not just an emergency situation. It's not like Sullenberger had to figure something out that he'd never thought about before. He used a whole lifetime of experience to deal with a crisis. I can't think of better words 
than the words that he gave. Let me give them to you again. He said, for 42 years, I've been making small regular deposits in this bank of experience, education, and training. And on January the 15th, the balance was sufficient so that I could take out a very large withdrawal. Last week, I showed you a verse in Psalms 50 where the Bible says you can call on God when you're in trouble. And that's true. I mean, even if you've, if you've, if you've been distant between you and God, still do that. Call on God when you're in trouble. And, and, and that's, that's, that's what it should be. But listen to me, please. I want you to hear something. I want to make sure I don't leave the wrong impression in this series. You can call on God when you're in trouble if you're not used to talking to him and he will still help you. But it will not be the same as a pilot who has been a daily student in God's flight school, learning God's word, trusting him on an everyday basis. It will be very different. If you want to be the kind of pilot in your life like Sullenberger was that day, it's not going to be something that you're just going to luck into. It's going to be a daily process. I mean, here's what the Bible says in 2 Peter. You must grow in the grace of and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not just you must visit the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, but you have to grow. Now think about this. There's a verb there. It's you must grow. God could have said other things. He could have said you should grow, you ought to grow, you might ought to think about growing. God says you must grow. See, (laughs) There are some people, there are some Christians that when they're, fly, when they're piloting through life, faith is like that flotation device that the flight attendants talk to you about at the beginning of the flight. You know, you're sitting on a cushion, it'll float. And, and, and it, most of us, when we get on a plane, we don't, we don't ever expect to use that. Most of us expect to live our entire lives and never pull our seat cushion out and float on water with it, Right? My favorite time to hear that is when I'm flying from Wichita to Minneapolis and I'm thinking, where's the water that we're going to, I mean, it have to be some farmer's stock pond. But uh, <laughs> there are people that have that idea about God. I mean, faith is just something that if I get into emergency, I'm going to use. The reason why the Bible says we must grow is we're going to be flying, and listen to me, please. This is so important. You and I are going to be flying on a routine day when suddenly nothing is going to be routine. It could be medical, it could be family, it could be relationship, it could be employment. I mean, you can just go, go through life. We all experience that. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 13, the Bible calls it the evil day. And some of you have already been there. You know what that's like. Man, you got up on a morning, you thought it was a typical morning, you're going to go to work, you're going to uh, do the things that you normally do, you already had your day scheduled out, but by 10 o'clock, your life changed. It could be a phone call from a doctor. It could be a phone call from law enforcement telling you about one of your kids being in trouble. It could be somebody you love being, I mean, you just go on and on and down the list. It's going to be what the Bible says, an evil day. And Peter says this in 1 Peter 4, 12. He said, dear friends, don't be surprised by the fiery troubles that are coming in order to test you. Don't feel as though something strange has happened to you. It's just life. I mean, we all have some level of turbulence practically every day, but someday you and I will have a situation in our life like Sullenberger had, and there won't be sunny skies and plenty of thrust and ample run mice. All the things that we've counted on won't be there. And it's at that moment that a whole lifestyle of faith, of trusting God every day, will pay off. Now, I want to read a verse to you that many of you, if you grew up in church like I did, you probably heard this verse, or even if you've read the Bible much at all, you probably heard at least some translation of this verse. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to hear this verse today in the context of what we're talking about. And when you hear the last line of it, think about Sullenberger. Okay, ready? Here we go. Every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people, lost or saved, believer, non-believer. But God keeps his promise, and he will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. At the time you are put to the test, he will give you the strength to endure it. And here's the Sullenberger line. And so provide you with a way out. You may not have Teterboro. <laughs> you, you may not have LaGuardia. You may have to land on the Hudson. But what God will do is he, if you have committed your life to trusting your instruments When that moment comes, God will give you a way out. In fact, some of us remember the King James translation, a way of escape. So somebody could say, well, Mark, as we get close to the end of this series, how do do I get ready in practical terms for this Sullenberger moment? I know you're about to end the series. I get it that preparation for difficulty is important. 
But tell me an easy to understand non-pilot language in real day, real everyday life. How do I live by faith? And how do I prepare for these tough moments? I get it that if I wait until the crisis comes, I won't have time to prepare. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with two scriptures. And maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll do flying by instruments too someday. And we'll just do a whole series on this part. Here's the first one. <laughs> I gotta tell you. <clears throat> this is one of the most important scriptures in the Bible that preachers almost never preach from. In fact, I've only heard one message on this in my entire life. And I remember very clearly when it was. I was 22 years old. I was, I was actually preaching in view of a call to a church in Houston. And the guy who brought this message was a missionary who was teaching the adult Sunday school class that morning. And I still remember that message. And I don't think I've ever preached from it. My bad. And the writer of Hebrews is talking about this topic that we're on. And he has a real interesting metaphorical view. He's talking about the difference between babies eating baby food and grown-ups eating grown-up food. And he's making the point that there are people that should be grown-ups that are still eating baby food. Okay? And you, you, get, you get that connection. I've talked about how that some people have the idea that faith is just something you keep on the shelf and you just sort of live your everyday life and pull it off the shelf when you need it. Okay? That's what this writer's talking about when he's talking about people that should be adults that they're eating spiritual baby food. Oh, let's pick it up. Hebrews 5 verse 14. Solid food is for the mature. And this is where the language gets really, really important. We're going to slow down. Who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Now, I want to back up and I want to just look at those three phrases in that verse because we've asked the question, how do we prepare? How do we live every day preparing not only for the turbulence of the day but for when crises come? Okay, I want to, I want to take the first phrase trained themselves. Now, you, you see the distinction here because the writer of Hebrews is talking about baby food. How do babies eat? I mean, you know, when you come home from the hospital with a newborn, I mean, or even when the baby's like six weeks old, you don't say, now, now baby, uh, this is where the refrigerator is and this is the range and the restroom's down the hall. No. Because that baby has to have everything done for them. See, a lot of people, their spiritual growth is spoon feeding. Now, notice here that the Bible says these people train themselves. In, in other words, they take the opportunities to grow spiritually by getting the word of God into themselves. They spend time every day with God. See, that is like training because I'll just tell you something. If you spend time every day, let's just say you carve out 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, an hour, you carve it, an, a, a segment of your day out just to read God's word, to let it speak to your heart, and you talk to God and you let God talk to you. There will be days when you don't feel like that. There will be days when you spend your 20, 30 minutes and you walk away and say, I don't think I got anything good out of that. Well, it's the same thing when you exercise, isn't it? I mean, there are days when you go to, to the workout facility and, I mean, you pump the iron, you do, all the, you, you do all the aerobics, you do all that stuff, and you can just feel yourself getting stronger. There are days when you walk out of there and think, man, I feel like I've been ridden hard and hung up wet. <laughs> and that's the thing. There, there, there is a training that you and I have to do that, thank God that we're, we're having an hour plus in, in, in church today, but we're talking about an everyday kind of thing where it's like I'm getting into the word of God. I'm seeing what God has to say. I'm listening to what God says to me. Sometimes people say, well, I don't know how to pray. Sometimes we should just get in God's presence and listen. And, and I want to go one more time to the problem because a lot of us, we don't spend time in God's word. We don't spend time in prayer. And then a crisis comes and we go to pieces. We're trying to find something that we should have trained for. So number one, this verse says they train themselves. Someone can say, well, Mark, I don't know. I read things in the Bible I don't understand. I have a degree in theology and I've been pastoring for 47 years. There's a lot of things I don't understand. But I just take, I love what Lincoln said because, you know, in his earlier years, Lincoln had been, at least he had portrayed himself as agnostic and Joshua Speed, who had known him when he was young, found Lincoln reading his Bible one day and he said, Lincoln, I can't believe that you believe the Bible. He said, what about all that stuff you don't understand? And Lincoln said, I take, I, I, I understand what I can understand and I take the rest of it by faith. There's a lot that I don't understand. 
<laughs> I love what Mark Twain said. Mark Twain said, it's not the part of the Bible I don't understand that bothers me, it's the part I do understand. <laughs> they train themselves. Phrase two, constant use. Constant use. Well, I don't need to go there because we've been talking about that all morning. In other words, it's not something that I just go to every once in a while. There's constant use. The Bible becomes familiar to me. Even, like I said, even if there's parts you don't understand, then just skip that and go to something that you do understand. And let the Holy Spirit make it relevant to you. Listen, guys, I've been a believer since I was eight years old. I've been preaching since I was 16. I've been pastoring for 47 years. I live every day in this book. And I got to tell you, there are days when I pick it up and it's like, wow, I've never seen that before. Well, I've read it many, many times, but it's just that the Holy Spirit comes and turns on all the lights. My wife and I are reading Psalm 25. I don't even know how many times I've read Psalm 25. It was like the other day, the Holy Spirit of God just pointed to stop and said, look at this, look at this, look at this. See, that's, that's what you need. And, and somebody will say, well, Mark, am I supposed to read an hour a day? Listen, I'd rather read one verse that changes my life than read three chapters if it doesn't. Just let God's word get into you. Why? Because this book is alive. It's, it's not just literature. It is alive. The book of Hebrews chapter four says it's alive and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's sharper than a scalpel's, uh, a surgeon's knife. And it cuts, us, cuts off what we don't need and it prepares us and equips us for life. Constant use. And that's how Sully could land that plane. Constant use. He knew that Airbus A320. He knew it like the back of his hand. He flew it every day. That's what we need, constant use. Okay, now the third line, and I've got one minute left, but if I take like four minutes extra, is that okay? <laughs> to distinguish between good and evil. Now, in the Greek language, there are two primary words for evil. One word is poneros. It means depraved, and we got a word pornography from it. And the other word is kakos. If you looked at it in English characters, it'd be K-A-K-O-S, kakos. And that's the word that's used here. The reason why I bring this up is the word kakos means worthless. It means just junk. It doesn't necessarily mean depravity. It just means living life for stuff that has no consequence. So here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that those of us who train ourselves in time with God and the word of God because of constant use we'll be able to know the difference between what's got some value and what doesn't have any value at all. I mean, we Americans are so blessed. I know that many of you watch this television program from 200 nations around the world other than the United States, and, 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 and you could teach us so much. But here in America, we have so much, we have so many things to distract us. I mean, how many of us live a whole year with about two or three total days of investment in what will be eternal. I'm sure I'm guilty. And the Bible says, okay, train yourself in constant use so that you'll be able to know the difference between what's valuable and what's not valuable. This is such an important verse that I want to show you one more translation. This time it's the New American Standard Bible. And I, th I love this verse because it really does remind me of so many things that Sullenberger said. Solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good from evil. You, you can imagine this message. I've read what feels like a million pages about Sullenberger's story and advice that he gives. But I, I tell you what, you can pretty well just bring all of his advice down to one word, practice. 20,000 hours of flying experience, routine time in the simulator every nine months. Those things had to be second nature in those precious seconds. And as Christ followers, we need the same kind of preparation and practice. There's a great story in the Bible. I love, I love Kids World. I just love walking around Kids World. And I've said to my wife so many times, don't you wish you could have grown up in this church? Because I wouldn't be near as crazy as I am if I could have grown up at New Spring. <laughs> but I grew up, and, and you, you guys are all too young to know what I'm talking about, okay? So just bear with me. Um, I grew up in Sunday school, and the, the most, <laughs> the, 
the most uh, powerful presentation tool they had was something called flannel graph. <laughs> and flannel graph, there would be a teacher up at the front. She would have a board that would be covered with flannel, and they would have cut out characters, figures from the Bible, and they would put it up on the board and smooth it out. And here, you know, us little five-year-old boys were sitting in there with their mouths open. But I remember one story that really got my attention, and that was Daniel in the lion's den. That's one thing, I'm interested in animals. And the teacher would put the story up and say, here's Daniel. And Daniel is a great man. He's a man of God. But he prays every day. Then there would be the picture of Daniel kneeling. And then there were people that hated Daniel and they wanted to get him in trouble with the king. And now here's the king. They put the king up there and these guys are tattletelling on Daniel that he prays all the time. And, uh, but they're not, they're not telling the king that it's Daniel because the king loves Daniel. They're just saying, we need to have a rule that anybody who prays to anybody except you will be thrown into a den of lions. And so now the teacher would put the lions up there. And now we've got Daniel over here but then Daniel's going to wind up in the lion's den. Now, there's a reason why I tell you that, because I want you to hear what the Bible says about Daniel and this whole topic that we're on today. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. <laughs> and if he's like some of us, he would have gone home, and here in Kansas, he would have gone to the basement, turned out all the lights. And in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Now, here's the line. As was his custom since early days. See, there's a crisis in his life. If he prays, he's going to be thrown into the lion's den. But see, Daniel flies by instruments and constant use and training himself. He's not going to change now what he's been doing all this time because, see, he's ready for this crisis moment. And then, you know, the teacher used to say, God shut the mouths of the lions and Daniel came out of the lion's den. Why? Trained himself, constant use. Knew the difference between what was good and worthless. One more verse and I'm finished with the series. If we want to know how to live our lives so that we deal with everyday turbulence, and the crisis, when the crisis comes, listen to the words of James 1, verse 22. Do not deceive yourselves by just listening to his word. Instead, put it into practice. If you listen to the word, but do not put it into practice, you're like people who see or look into a mirror and see themselves as they are. They look at themselves and then go away and forget what they look like. But if you look closely, constant use, if you look closely into the perfect law that sets people free and keep on paying attention to it and do not simply listen and then forget it, but put it into practice, you will be blessed by God in what you do. That, ladies and gentlemen, is flying by instruments. Thank you for being in the series. Let's bow our heads. You know, the thing that just keeps filling my heart as I speak is how that God does not leave us alone to navigate the ugly skies of life, but rather God, like I taught you last week in the QRH book, you're not alone in the cockpit. But it could be that someone here say, Mark, I, I don't know that God is in my, I don't know that God is with me. Um, I don't feel that God is with me. Well, I'll tell you how you can be sure. And it's something you can handle right now. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to do anything. It's something you can handle right now, whether you're sitting in one of our auditoriums or you're in your car listening to this on the internet or you're watching it on television. You can handle it right where you are. The Bible says that a relationship with God is a gift, G-I-F-T. It's why the Bible uses the term grace. Grace comes from the Greek word charis, which means gift. When you know someone's got charisma, they're gifted. 
Grace means gift. It is by grace that you're saved. By faith, faith is trusting your instruments. By faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And that gift is forgiveness. It's a relationship with God. It's everlasting life. And how, do you, how, could that, how could something so big be a gift? Well, Jesus bought it. He bought it when he carried a cross up a hill and hung between heaven and earth for six hours. And the way God looked at it, the blood that came out of his body was a currency that paid for everything I ever will or ever have done wrong. And the same for you. And no matter who you are, if you are willing by faith, if you're willing to trust your instruments, trust the word of God, you can ask for this gift. If you will believe that Jesus died for you, if you will believe that he arose from the grave, if you will just put your confidence in him, you can receive this gift. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You don't have to pray these exact words. These, this is just a prayer that reaches out for Jesus. But if you mean it in your heart, God will hear your prayer. And uh, I'm going to pray it. You can repeat it if you want to. I'm going to put a little break so you can decide if you want to say it. The words are not what gets you in a relationship with God. It's what you mean in your heart or in your inner person. And uh, you don't even have to pray it out loud. So here we go. And uh, I'll put a little break in between each line. Dear God, I am a sinner. But I believe you love me very much. I believe by faith that Jesus died to pay for my sins. And I believe that he arose from the grave. And since Jesus is alive, I want him as my savior. And I bow before him as my king. Thank you for hearing my prayer. By your power, I turn from my old life and my desire is to follow Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just pray with me, I have a gift I want to give you. This is, it's got a New Spring Bible in here, a little book that you heard someone talk about earlier that I wrote called My New Walk with God. Some other wonderful things. It's free. won't cost you anything. If you're watching on television or on the internet, you can just text the word PRAY, P-R-A-Y-E-D, to 97,000. Follow the steps, and we will mail this to you. But if you're here on campus, there's no reason to wait. Just go back to any info center. You'll recognize it by the blue and white color. And just say, I pray with Mark. You can take this home today. God bless. Thank you. Appreciate you being here today.